so we are officially live on Facebook. Hello, everybody. This is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. Um, I am super excited about tonight. We have an amazing horror author panel for you. The end is only the beginning. So I'm going to go ahead and let all of our authors introduce themselves to you and go ahead and disappear. Have an amazing event. You guys are in for a big treat. Bye, guys. Bye, Constance. Hi. So uh, I'm Grady Hendricks. I'm the moderator. I'm the author of the book that just came out on April 7th, right in the middle of the pandemic, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. Um, and that was terrifying. Uh, I'm moderating, so I will be calling people out. Usually this could be more of a discussion, but let's go on down the line. Alma, ladies first. Hi, I'm Alma Katsu. I also had a book come out just during the pandemic, The Deep. I write um, historical fiction with a little horror twist. Steven? Stephen Graham Jones. My next book is All the Good Indians, and then comes Night of the Mannequins. I've got a lot of other books. I'm in Boulder, Colorado. Paul. Hey, I'm Paul Tremblay, and uh, my new book, Survivor Song, is coming out in July, and it's about a pandemic. Who knew? <laughs> so... Uh, we wanted to talk tonight about sort of how horror is obsessed with the idea of endings being the beginnings, uh, because everyone's talking about how this is sort of an ending and they're all having dreams about moving either to Boulder or Las Vegas, but it's not, it's only the beginning. And so I guess where I wanted to start was to ask you guys, um, like something had to end for you to decide you're going to write horror, like, uh, or you were obsessed with endings or obsessed with, with life after death or ghosts, or you had a job end and you need to get a new job. For me, uh, growing up in the 80s, I was obsessed with the nuclear war because my dad told me that um, Charleston, South Carolina, where we lived, was uh, one of the top 10 targets for the Soviet Union for no, it wasn't. It's no, yeah, that's based on nothing. Yeah, and, um, but he was like, you know, when nuclear war starts within half an hour, everyone you know will be gone and this whole city will just be glass. And um, that was pretty bleak because I was like seven. And um, so I got obsessed with post-apocalypse, post-World War III books. So I was reading stuff like War Day, which is like, you know, World War III happens, but it's not so bad. And um, like the Phoenix books where it's like World War III happens, but then cool dudes with like guns get to sort of ride around fighting mutants. So, and I think that sort of led to here, but I don't know, Alma, what was the ending that got you obsessed or into horror? Well, gosh, into horror, that's a tough one. Um, I think I was just born that way. I kind of blame being raised a Roman Catholic, which makes you like super superstitious. And then I also hmm. grew up in an incredibly spooky little town in New England. Um, you know, I tell people it had like more cemeteries per square mile than any other what town? place. I'm sorry, it's Maynard, Massachusetts. I don't know if okay. they still hold that that honor. And I had a funeral home literally one block in two different directions from my house. So it was just, I was just always around that. But I had a real ending actually that got me started back in my writing career. You know, I was working for the government and at about 40, I got really sick. I got this strange neurological disorder, uh, constant vertigo. So I couldn't work at the time. I couldn't use a computer. I couldn't watch TV. I, all I could do was I just started writing fiction again, longhand on paper. And uh, it just reminded me how much I loved writing and how I'd gotten away from it. So that was, I mean, it wasn't quite the ending because I still had to work, I had to eat, but um, it, it was a sort of an ending that was the start of something new for me. Steven? You know, for me, the ending that got me into writing anyway, is not, not into horror yet, but into writing was, girlfriends in high school because the, the, it would always be the end of our relationship or the end of our date or whatever it was and then it would be because I screwed up in some way of course and the only way I could get back in this girl's good graces was to write a big long six page thinly veiled metaphoric story about two swans on a pond and how they are meant to be together forever then I would fold it three times and leave it under her windshield wipers and if I wrote that story well enough she would call me up and we could go out again for one more night until I had to write another letter. So it was the ending of very many um, relationships that probably started me writing. As for what started me into horror though, that would be the end of Friday the 13th part four where little Tommy Jarvis um, cuts into Jason, Jason's head, I think it's 14 times. When I was in eighth grade, 
living down outside Wimberley, Texas, one of my friends knew somebody at the video store every Friday afternoon after school, he would give us a stack of slashers and Friday the 13th floor was always part of it. And we'd go back to my friend's garage and watch it and until two or three in the morning. And we'd all count with Tommy when he's, when he's hitting Jason and everything. And then about two in the morning, his dad would get drunk enough that he'd dress up like Freddy and put a claw on and come outside the garage and scrape his plastic, you know, knife fingers on the door. And we would explode out the side door of the garage and just run blind, smiling and crying and laughing for the creek. If we could jump in the creek, we'd be safe in the dark, you know? And that I think is when I got hooked on the horror. All right, Paul. I have a hard time getting past that there are all these short stories out there about two swans. And they're yeah. all titled, they're all titled, if yes, check this box. <laughs> <laughs> I hope um, every single one is about two swans. <laughs> oh boy. Um, well, I mean, I think both, uh, obviously all this is like sort of in retrospect, I would say for the writing part of it, which automatically was horror because that was always my interest. I would say similar to Grady, I had a, a deathly fear of nuclear war, except I went, I, I wanted to avoid all things about nuclear war. So I, you know, I didn't throw myself into, you know, reading World War III apocalypse books, which is probably the better way to go. Um, <laughs> maybe anyway. So for me, really quickly, two endings. One was the end of college. Um, obviously, it was like the end of being a kid, essentially. And that was when I fell in love with reading. It was sort of like a really odd time. I just started dating my girlfriend, seriously, who's now my wife. Um, and I went off to grad school for two years. And that's where I, you know, I was, you know, hundreds of miles away from my girlfriend. So we did the long distance thing. And, you know, grad school is so different than undergrad. You're not like going out to parties all the time, for one thing. So I had all this time and I just read Stephen King and Peter Straub and Shirley Jackson. And um, at the end of grad school, I was like, I don't know what to do. I guess I'll teach math. Oh, maybe I'll start writing too. <laughs> um, so to me, it was almost like the end of childhood and becoming an adult was almost like a moment of panic. What the hell are you gonna do? Well, I know I can teach math, but I'd rather like do something fun, maybe writing too. Um, I would say the one end that I've discovered that, I've, that I'm always writing about in some way um, and I wrote about this a little bit in my short story collection, Growing Things in the Notes section. Um, my father worked at the Parker Brothers Toy Factory in Salem, Massachusetts uh, for 25 years. You know, it was built in like 1917. It had been there, you know, it had been in Salem for its whole history, you know, 80, 80 years almost. Um, and when I was in high school and early years of college, I would, I would work there during the summers. Uh, and it sounds weird because, you know, the image of a factory, you know, doesn't bring like rosy memories to many people, but man, it was a really fun place to work. Everybody knew everybody, you know, from assembly line workers to, you know, the upper management. My dad was not upper management. He, you know, he, he didn't go to college. He started on the assembly lines and he was in charge of the mailroom after 25 years when I was there. So, you know, I would work in the assembly lines. I would unload trucks. They would let me drive forklifts, which was not OSHA approved. <laughs> um, but in the summer of 91, you know, there were rumblings about Hasbro buying out Parker Brothers. You know, and they'd been through that before, like Taka had bought them out. And, you know, you know so people were like, ah, oh, we've been this through before. But, you know, there was like a nervous, you know, scared energy in the place. And then there was just one day, um, they called all employees into the, that worked in the factory into the cafeteria. And just like within two minutes announced, uh, Hasbro bought it we're shutting this factory down and everyone's, you know, has no job within two months. Like it's going to be closed in November. Um, you know, and there were tears and, you know, screams. And I just never forget the feeling of unfairness that I, you know, summer help was finding out about the closing of the plant at the same time as my father who'd been there for 25 years at the same time as all these other adults. Um, anyway, so that ending for me was, I think a lot of ways the start of me being a writer because I've worked that backstory into many things, sometimes obliquely, sometimes not obliquely. Um, so everyone here has some experience with stuff ending and then your life sort of continues, right? Alma, like your health sort of came to this point where it's like, God, life as I know it is ended. Steven, you're talking about these relationships within high school probably does feel like the world is ending. Paul, it's like this whole way of life in this town ending and then things go on, right? There's always the apocalypse and then there's something afterwards, right? There's post-apocalyptic, I guess. Um, so I was gonna ask you guys, like, which is more interesting to you? Like from a fictional point of view, everything falling apart or how things come back together afterwards? Like for me, 
I really get bored. I love George Romero zombie movies, but I get bored about the ones about how we're going to live after that. Like Dawn of the Dead's great to me until they're just stuck in that mall forever. And then the later movies when it's like, and then the zombies become our friends. I'm like, eh, who cares? Um, so I'm curious with you guys, like for me, it's about falling apart. That's what I'm fascinated by. So I don't know, for you guys, is it you're more fascinated in things falling apart or how it survives afterwards? How about if someone else starts this time? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Steven, go for it. Yeah. You know, I think, I never thought about that before. I think I'm interested in more, not necessarily how it comes together, but I'm interested in the moments after the apocalypse. I'm specifically interested in like 10 or 15 years after the apocalypse, because then as a reader or an audience, I get to experience, or maybe as a writer too, I get to experience that dramatic irony of like Charlton Heston finding the Statue of Liberty on the beach, you know, <laughs> and, and I'm like, and it, I, I loved it. I know something and I don't know, it, it, it's like instant nostalgia, you know, and I, I like seeing remnants of the old world. Like when, what's that science fiction novel? Um, Canticle for Leibowitz, you know, where, mm -hmm. we see, where, where we see things decay over the millennia. And I'm really fascinated with that forever. I think it's because I love um, archaeology and anthropology. I just love the idea of digging up bones. And so I like the idea of seeing our bones persist, you know? Right, right. Like we become the relics. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul, I don't know, do you like things? I mean, your last two books have quite literally, well, the one coming up and the previous one have yeah. quite literally been about an apocalypse. Right. Um, so yeah, so where are you on this? Well, I mean, I'm definitely frightened more by sort of the moment we're in, like the things falling apart and, the, and it has been sort of a, uh, a mini obsession of my fiction writing to the point where I had a short story collection from a small press come out in 2010 called In the Meantime. And I think like eight of the, or nine of the 13 stories were all about, you know, I wouldn't call them, a, you know, post-apocalyptic, they were more like either pre-apocalyptic or building up to like some event. You know, so it's certainly always been a fear of mine. I think that's a remnant of, you know, growing up in the eighties and, you know, believing that, you know, we were going to see World War III. So, but <laughs> that's just more my fear. I don't know if that's more my interest. I mean, I think it's, Your far, more, I think it's far more interesting to see, you know, see how things are going to get built back after an event. But as a writer, I can't get past <laughs> that event. And, you know, I, and all those stories that we mentioned or that I mentioned, I always tend to focus on like a small set of characters. And I guess maybe that's more my interest, like how people are going to, how do, how do people deal with this big change? Um, yeah. You know, because in fiction, it's safer. You can, that, that big change can also represent, you know, the changes in your everyday life kind of thing. Yeah. Well. Alma, you want to weigh in on this one? So, yeah. So in real life for about 10 years, I used to run crisis response teams for the government, <laughs> for the Defense Department. So when we had to do a quick action, usually it was like a humanitarian disaster. Sometimes it was a natural disaster, you know, earthquake in Pakistan or something like that. Not the, not the big response, but a certain aspect of it that I won't go into. If you know my past, you'll know why. But um, so probably what I'm going to say is going to sound a little funny, maybe even a little callous. But um, I like when things go bad because maybe this is just a sort of optimism born out of seeing it over and over again. Once we've sort of hit the bottom and can start rebounding, I've just seen how, you know, how we've done it over and over again. There's organizations and there's institutions and it's, it's necessary work of course, but it's a little boring when you've done it, <laughs> you know, when you've been there over and over again. And as a writer, I really enjoy the thrill of trying to make things go bad as, as worse as possible. That's like a question I always ask myself as I'm, I'm plotting or thinking through a scene or something, what's the worst that could happen? And then I write it, you know, and then it just takes you to a new and, and fun place. Let me ask you a question, because since you worked in all these disaster response situations, is there some cliche in horror about like crisis or apocalypse or disaster that drives you nuts because you just know that's not what happens? Well, you know, so uh, I guess it would depend on the disaster. Um, and so much horror is so much more personal, you know, as mm -hmm. opposed to what happens in these types of events, which are usually like really big scale. Um, so it, it might not be, uh, I might not see the same situations that you see portrayed a lot in, 
in horror stories. And I, that, that's probably the part of horror I enjoy the most is that it is so personal. You know, even if you are looking at like a, a pandemic or something, you know, World War Z, it's still focusing down on like a specific event. You know, it might be a chain of events and specific people, you know, that really make you feel it. And that's probably the one thing when you're actually in it, um, as things are unfolding, you do have to sort of disassociate yourself from what's going on at the time, or it can be emotionally overpowering. Almost everybody who gets in that line of work goes through, gets PTSD afterwards and, and kind of has to learn to, to sort of, you know, decouple yourself from a situation during the time, just so that you can react, you know, in the way you need to. Sure. I wonder, I wonder if cannibal is like, it seems like most apocalyptic stories feature cannibalism even the road and paul i think you you skip it in the survivor song which is good i think you know um because because everybody else does it um i wonder if that's what that's one of the tropes that is um overused i don't i don't know um cannibalism is fun to write about for sure you know yeah and, and i mean it's like one of our taboos it's biologically built in and all um Myself, I don't really think it's that bad. I think it's just meat, but I know that people don't like it a lot. You know? <laughs> have, you written, have you written a book with cannibalism in it, Stephen? I had to have. I don't know. I don't really keep track. But <laughs> I don't know. Well, Alma, that's the whole central thing in The Hunger, right? Right. It was the Donner Party. But yeah. what we decided to do, because, you know, I there's a good two or 300 pages that ended up on the cutting room floor on that book over time. And um, what we ended up deciding to do at a certain point is, um, to actually like take cannibalism out. It doesn't really show up until the very, very end of the book because that's what people were expecting. So we wanted to, to have this suspense carry through. So I actually got a little shortchanged on the cannibalism thing. I didn't really get to revel in it at all. Paul, have you had cannibals? Uh, I have one novella that's kind of weird. It's called The Harlequin in the Train. Um, and actually right now it, it appears in a book called Another Way to Fall, put out by Concord Free Press. And if you write Concord Free Press an email, they'll send you the book for free. Uh, the, only, the, only, the only catch is that you're supposed to make a charitable donation in lieu of the book. Hmm. And, and this is something they do for all their books. It's not something that they do just do right now. That, and it's that's myself good. and Brian Evanson have a novella in it. Anyway, so my novella is sort of Fight Club with Cannibals, hmm. where the, the, the novel opens where this train conductor, uh, you know, just in the East Coast of Massachusetts, on the commuter train, he, you know, he's running the train, he sees this weird Harlequin clown on the tracks and it hits the clown. And then all these people who are dressed like, you know, businessmen, doctors, professionals, you know, come out of the brush and eat a little bit of what's left over and then hightail it out and it gets weirder from there. So yeah. Eat that's what's one. left over of the clown? Eat, eat, yeah, eats what's left over of the clown, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's the first thing I ever read of Paul's back in like 07 or something, 06, is that right? Is yeah, that... it's old, like I wrote it as a short story, oh. like way back in like 03, 04, and then I tried what to make you... a screenplay, and then I turned the screenplay into a novella instead. What do you have against this poor clown? Well, I mean, maybe the clown isn't all he's dressed up to be. <laughs> don't, is it, don't tell me he's like Jesus. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, like, no. well, no, I was just saying people are eating a bit of, like, because when I no, was in- it's much less yeah. supernatural. Yeah, in yeah. high school, they showed us this film in chapel that was like about a really crappy clown in a circus. And then like, no one will laugh and he's trying his hardest because they're like the measles people. And then they like beat him to death, all the spectators, but he's supposed to be Jesus. It was really dark. Um, it was that, weird. That was a Bob, Bob Cass Colby clown thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is like this is like the early 80s like there was there was no hold bars on what you saw in chapel back then Great. Have, you, have, you done, have you done cannibalism I'm, I'm trying to think through all your books never had cannibalism um i wrote us the first screenplay i ever tried to sell was about um animal rights activist vegans who run across a bunch of gourmet cannibals um, who meet once a year to like uh, have a sort of eat a person because it's like a real and um, and yeah no one picked that up it, it was it was one of those things where like you're like I'm gonna make the movie I want to see and it's got like psychedelic farts in it and it was it was just really not a movie anyone else wanted to see um, but okay so just to, to actually Alma, if I can just ask you real quick, I've always wondered, so the Donner Party, like half of them in real life survived, right? Yes, about half the party survived. 
did they like spend the rest of their life like with their neighbors being like cannibal? Like, did they live in the shadow of this forever? Do people just forget it? No, no, I don't think they lived in the shadow of it. Um, I, I just think it was sort of a little bit different time than what we envision now. But, you know, they were sought out routinely by newspapers, you know, to give interviews. Some of them kind of, you know, tried to recuse themselves from all that. Others kind of reveled in it. The one guy who was really believed to have been a, can you know, there was a lot of debate as to how much cannibalism actually took place. But there was one guy, and he's kind of the bad guy in my book, um, Louis Kiesberg who um, admitted that he, you know, ate members of the party. And then he tried to recant. I mean, he was very vocal about it. And then like an idiot, he opened a hotel with a restaurant in it. And of course, <laughs> right, got a lot of bad press, got very bitter over it, and then withdrew. So, and then, you know, even into their, their um, some of the, the young kids who had survived, even into their old age, I think we're still trying to come to terms with what had happened to the group. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah, I've always been curious. You know, y'all may have had this experience too. Um, when you go out to play basketball in the spring after it's been cold all winter, you go out to the park and play and you get a lot of blisters, you know, because you haven't played all winter. And I did that probably 10, 15 years ago. And I came back limping back from the park with all these blisters. And I had this one blister on my heel that was about the size of a silver dollar. And so I jumped oh, out. <laughs> I jumped up on the tailgate in my truck and I pulled out my knife from the gun compartment and I carved that blister off, a big old thick piece of skin, and I threw it on the ground and I thought I'm gonna go inside now. But sure enough, my dog trots up and she sniffs it and then she slurps it up and she sits there on her haunches and she stares at me while she chews this like a piece of gum for probably like a minute and a half. And um it's like she was judging me and it took her a long time to get that blister down. It was a weird experience to watch something eat a big piece of you. You know, I don't so recommend crazy. I know that happens to you when you play basketball all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, all, all my basketballing <laughs> games in the hooping. Uh, yeah. No, I although played, my... I play basketball, I can say that's never happened to me, but I've also never <laughs> cut off a piece of my flesh to feed to my dog. <laughs> well, I have to say though, you know, I have an aunt who doesn't like an animal to lick her. Like she really, and she doesn't like animals to lick you if you're at your house, like her cats. Cause she's like, now it knows what you taste like. And she really gets upset about that. I don't think we taste that good, to be honest. Well, apparently like, Stephen does. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that dog was sort of like, I fucking you right there. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I have to imagine, did you like then try to even the scale by cutting off some of its like fur and eating it? Like- I should've, that's, that's the, the proper, relationship and I proper response yeah. Yeah. yeah so wait out of curiosity so i've been trying to think about this because i was trying to be a smart moderator who here has had an immortal character in one of your books like i have paul have you in a book no yeah. i mean or well, a novella or i mean unless you think like a head full of ghosts there's an actual demon i guess that might be but yeah, yeah. Okay. i'd say not really no Okay, Stephen, you, someone I've done, immortal? I've done, I've done a lot of vampires in my stories and I presume they're, they're immortal. I don't yeah. stick with them my whole life, you know? Yeah. So someone explained to me like immortality because we're all supposed to think old people are like wise and adorable and everything. But then if you're too old, like if you're immortal, you're fucking creepy. Like every immortal character in books for the most part is like, kind of creepy and sociopathic, you know? Like what, what, what is this instinctual revulsion we have towards immortality and immortal characters? I think it's that they're outside the natural order. Like we define life as something that's bound by death, you know? And so when something oversteps that boundary, then it's no longer a natural thing. And we all collectively go with our torches and pitchforks and kill it, you know, or try to kill it. But, but we've developed entire religious systems yeah. that are like, well, actually, death isn't the end. You go on and live in another way. You're reincarnated. You go to another special magic place. So, I mean, I hear you, but I'm not sold on it. Like, I don't know. Well, when we're, when we're fictionalizing immoral characters, you're not thinking of yourself, like, living on in eternity in some religious context. So at least, I mean, I don't think most people are. Right. Um, so I don't know, like to me, it'd be like the horror of all those accumulated memories. Like what does that do to somebody? Like uh, could you possibly hold all those unless I guess you obviously have some super, super immortal brain too. Yeah. But you know, that's gotta mess with you. Like, yeah. Um, I think that's because you're just, a thoughtful person, Paul. <laughs> I mean, most people, I mean, my feeling is most people have a very difficult time conceiving of a time when there is no more them, right? They're always projecting. Sure. 
themselves. And I think that's the fascination with the mortality. And you can talk, you know, I talked to a lot of folks and they don't picture themselves ever dying. They just picture themselves going on and on, even when they're very old. I mean, I remember kind of being shocked talking to my father who had terrible health and lived far longer than any of us ever expected. And he just could not accept the fact that he was gonna die someday. And it was a huge shock the day that it actually happened. So that's kind of why I think so many people, you know, like embrace stories, whether they're like vampire stories about immortality or religious stories. It's because it, it just kind of continually feeds this expectation that, oh no, we're actually not gonna die. No, and I think there's a, a definite connection between apocalyptic fiction appeal as well, you know, especially maybe, you know, in the Western tradition, um, as Constance is bringing up in our chat here. Um, <laughs> no, but the idea that when we talk about apocalyptic fiction or post-apocalyptic fiction, I think most people, like, you know, the fans of that, like, like to imagine themselves, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to be the one that lives, you know, I'm going to be Charlton oh, Wilson yeah. with, a, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be the one that makes it. Um, shoot, what the heck was I going to say? Um, you know, they never think, oh yeah, I'm going to be the one that dies. Like in the first wave of the tsunami or whatever, whatever else oh, happens, yeah. there's that, there's that very much, I'm important enough that I was one of the survivors. And I think, you know, similar to the immortal character, that's the huge appeal of, yeah, yeah I'm not going to die. Well, everyone's a final girl, right? Yeah, they right. think they are, yeah. yeah. Until the machete comes for them. Until Steven shows up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, no, totally. When I was a kid, like I was never an irradiated mess dying of like, you know, horrible lesions. I was like on a freaking dune buggy with an AK-47, like fighting mutants in the post-apocalyptic South yeah. Carolina, yeah. Um, which wasn't that much different from pre-apocalyptic South Carolina. <laughs> Were there any basketball courts in post-apocalyptic no. South Carolina? my nemesis. <laughs> um, just went around blowing them up. Exactly. Um, so just to, well, actually, Stephen, let me ask you. So you're a big slasher guy. So can a slasher movie end, right? They always reset. Like part of the genre that's baked in is another one. So is there such a thing as an ending for a slasher or are they sort of this eternal cycle? They are, I think they are an eternal cycle if there's enough um, box office receipts or book sales to, you know, right. to, get a, get a, to get a sequel, of course. Um, the, the final girl puts a slasher down temporarily, you know, but the slasher, the slasher is revenge driven and there's always going to be people who need revenging. You know, there's always going to be people doing the prank on the helpless person in class, or there's always going to be people just doing some sort of trespass or crime that the law isn't punishing. So a spirit of vengeance rises and takes form and meets out that punishment like tenfold. You know, like, mm -hmm. yes, slashers are all about disproportionate response and they get carried away and they, they don't just kill the counselors, they kill everybody, you know, but, um, but they, they have good intentions. They just have, they just get carried away and they don't, but you can't put a slasher down. No, except for with no sales. No sales is the only thing that puts a slasher down. <laughs> it's the only genre where the monster's directly tied into box office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I like um, that. I love, I love that direct artery to the market. You know, I think that keeps it healthy, you know? So uh, Constance is sending in some questions right now. Um, and she's asking, so Alma, yeah, the last, you just did the um, Donner party, but then you just did the sinking of the Britannic. Um, Titanic and the Britannic, yep. That whole cursed line, yeah. Um, so someone's <laughs> asking, or via Constance, do you have another historical project or event you're sort of toying with right now? I do. Um, the next book is gonna have to do with World War II, but I've been getting a lot of teasing about being the queen of disaster. And um, I do have to like spend a lot of time looking up famous historical disasters or people will send me ideas and I have, I'll be in the unfortunate position of telling them that it's not disastrous enough. Not enough people died. Wasn't a significant enough, you know, it didn't stop the use of whatever covered wagons going west. It's, uh, it's interesting what the criteria is, you know, for how, how many people are enough people. You know, so that's a question I used to ask policymakers all the time when we were asked to do projections on genocides and stuff. They would want to know, well, how many people are going to die in this mass atrocity? And you want to ask them, well, what number are you looking for? What number is the one that's going to make you actually do something about it, right? It, it's a hard, hard thing to know. I mean, 
what am I going to do now after the Titanic? You know, 1,300 yeah. people died. It's hard to top that. Yeah. Although I feel like once you get over like a thousand people, it's sort of people get numb to it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's kind of like that. returns. Those two FBI agents in Die Hard going up in the helicopter saying they're going to lose 20% of the hostages in the explosion. And that's an acceptable margin, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so someone was asking a uh, skill set in an apocalypse. Like, where do you think you'd thrive and where do you think you'd struggle in an apocalyptic situation? Stephen, you want to try this I, one? I would struggle terribly at let's eat whatever this canned food is because I eat very few foods. I'll eat mostly chicken strips and peanut butter sandwiches and fish sticks, I guess. And um, so this idea about eating peas for dinner and then green beans the next night and like refried beans on the third night, I don't, I would just go face the zombies probably because I would not do well in that situation at all. Um, as for what my strength would be, um, I've always been good at breaking into places. I've always been good at um, getting in, getting through a door or through a window. And so I think I'd be good at that. And that would just get me more trouble because I'd be in there with zombies who have been in there for three months and are really hungry, you know? But so either way, I don't last long in the zombie apocalypse at all. I'm, go I'm gone. If I make it through the apocalypse, and th th it's just pure luck. And I die the first day. All strength and weakness. Uh, I think mine's the exact opposite. I think my only strength would be to be leftovers man. And I've actually found that out during this month that I've been here. That I actually, uh, I, I tweeted about I ate a combination of vegetable lasagna leftovers with French toast leftovers. I ate that in one. I didn't put them together. I'm not a monster. I didn't make a sandwich out of it. I ate the vegetable lasagna first, and then I had the two pieces of French toast. That I ever reheat French toast? That's a little tricky. It was a learning curve to that. I, yeah. I put it in the toaster oven, and that I toasted the end piece too long, and it just like shriveled up into a charcoal. That was kind of hard to eat, but I ate it. Damn it. Wow. <laughs> um, and wait, weakness. Weakness, everything else. I have no like life supporting skills. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't think math's going to be that important. I can't because I can't even apply it. It's just like calculus, <laughs> geometry. I can't like build anything. Um, so yeah. Alma, strength and weakness in an apocalypse. My strength is probably my CIA training in moral relativism. So I can pretty much help you justify just about anything you want to do. <laughs> my weakness is running. I'm, I'm getting old now and running is not such a, a key, you know, core strength anymore. What about you, yeah. Greg? What's yours? Uh, strength is I'll eat anything, like really anything. And, um, my wife's a chef and that actually, I've got a working knowledge of sort of how to pickle things, how to make stuff. like, so I think I'd be okay food wise, but I think where I'd get into trouble is I know just enough first aid to take on any first aid situation with a lot of confidence, but I don't know enough to execute fully and successfully. So I think I'd be someone who keeps being like, oh, I can stitch that up. And then I'd really, you'd wind up bleeding out, you know, oh, let me splint your leg. And I'd wind up like breaking it off. Like, <laughs> oh, you know, I guess I have another strength that I mentioned earlier in this talk. Um, if I'm trapped in a room and we have to eat somebody, I wouldn't, that wouldn't like break my heart, you know? Like every time I'm in, every time I'm, I'm in an elevator and it kind of stutters, I'm like, who's going to go first? Which one's going to start, you know? Um, it, it, I don't know, it wouldn't bug me too much. I don't so you can't, it, but... you can't do peas, green beans, like no. vegetables, but if you had to eat a person. As long as it's, as long as it's cooked all the way through, if there's any pink, any pink, I'm not doing it, but if it's oh. all the way through. Yeah, it's going to be hard to get well done in like human flesh. I don't know. I mean, I think it's really oh. fatty, like pork. I think if you cook it, like there's a lot of fat that cooks off. It depends on right, but, but I think if you right. ask for like, ask for a well done human flesh, you'd get, you know. Like, oh, but come on, that, only, that only, a, yeah. only a jerk <laughs> asks for well done yeah. human flesh. You medium rare tops. And then you probably <laughs> will ask for ketchup too. I would. I would. <laughs> um, Paul, wait, just to be right. Someone's asking, um, do you feel that your uh, that teaching math affects your writing style or your like structure? Because they say that you have very um, deliberate balance in your narrative structure, like a math teacher. Yeah, I get that question frequently. I, I I've never written a math story for one. Uh, I wish I have. Um, oh shoot, Elizabeth Zemenska. I'm saying her last name wrong. Wrote the Mandelbrot yeah. effect or something for Tor.com, which is really good. Anyway, um, 
No, like, well, I, I take that back. I think maybe like my approach to writing is analytical um, insofar as that I can't skip around. I have to go in the order in which I think it appears in the book. I mean, mo most of my books, you know, jump around timeline wise, but I don't do one timeline first and a timeline second. I have to go in order painstakingly, like 500 words at a time. You know, you know, sometimes I get more, sometimes I get less, but you know, maybe that's mathy. I have no idea. Like, I wish I was someone who could just like get it all out or someone like Steven who's writing, secretly writing a story, you know, with his hands underneath the desk right now uh, while we're on this, <laughs> while we're on the Zoom call. I just can't do that. You know, I, th I think, I mean, looking from the outside, it seems like horror stories are all subtraction problems, you know? Like, we start out with 12 people, then we have 11, then we have 10, and then we have just me left, and that really sucks. I want I want to be the remainder. That's with the vision, I guess, but it's not going to happen, for me, you know? Yeah. I mean, or there are addition problems, right? You've got one zombie or vampire, then you've got right. two, then you've got four. I still can't wrap my head around exponential. That could be exponential, yeah. Yeah. Can't, yeah. can't quite get there. Actually, oh, I was going to ask you guys, so what's harder for you, starting a book, like actually starting a book and being like, okay, this is a book or sticking the landing? Starting, not even close for me. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, for, yeah, there's always a danger within the first 100 pages for me that I'm going to stop. To me, really? like 140, yeah, 100 pages is about, is for me, it's like, okay, once I get past that, I feel sort of morally obligated to, to write the book. Uh, but yeah, I, I've got like two or three that I've written a hundred pages of, and you know, I was just like, no, this isn't working. Wow. Put it away. So no, and like typically when I start a book, my word counts are really small in the beginning, and maybe you know, and I, I have to build up steam. And by the time I'm towards the end, you know, whether or not I stick the landing or not, like in terms of like how I feel about writing it, I definitely feel a lot more confident. I know where I am. You know, it's, it's, it's the opposite for me, like starting, like I have a problem not starting novels. I can start novels, no problem. And I usually end the novels I start, but the ending is always tricky. It's always hard to like stick the landing, like you're saying, Grady. Um, and what I, what, I, what I found works a little bit is when I get what feels like about 5% from the ending, I can see that it's going to happen in like 30 pages or something. Then I'll close down that file and I'll open up a lot of new files, blank pages, and I'll make myself write six or eight little flash fictions because a flash fiction story is ending from the moment it begins. And I feel like what that does is it works out my ending muscles. And so then I write those six stories in like two days and I close that. And then I go back to the ending with my ending muscles warmed up and I can usually burn through a passable version of the ending. It'll take like, like 600 revisions to make it good, but I can usually sketch it out, you know? Yeah. That's um, interesting. I, I, I'm gonna try to remember that tip. Yeah. For the next time for me sticking the ending is always hard i'm like Stephen. i can i can start many many stories and enjoy them all but somehow the ending never makes my agent or my editor happy and yes, well, don't cool. listen to them yeah your screw agent. those guys sorry Stephen. <laughs> all of them have the same agent so i can say that um <laughs> yeah i was gonna say i can't oh, start a book yeah until i know the ending really oh man yeah, i usually yeah, I usually have an ending in mind. Like it can change a little bit, but really, yeah, yeah. I, I never have an ending. I always think, I hope this works out, and then sometimes I get lucky. Dude, yeah. are you are you kidding? <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> um, so uh, someone was asking, um, which I think is a really disturbed question. Um, you have to choose if you have to choose a human being to eat, but you have to choose one of the characters from your books. Who's the guy? Who? It, this is really. I mean. I'll just say who I wouldn't eat is I do have an immortal character in one book who gets chopped into pieces and they're still moving. And like, I can't imagine you're eating someone and like they're in your stomach just kind of wreathing about. That's just, that's horrible. So you should be ashamed of yourself, whoever asked that question. Alma, who would you eat from your books? Huh, that's hard. I guess somebody young and tender. I mean, you don't want somebody, <laughs> you know, sort of sinewy and wiry. So I'll just add this though. You know, when you write a book that's about cannibals, you, you end up getting a lot of cannibalism lore in your head or facts, I should say, because, you know, I read all about like how people actually chopped up bodies and what parts you eat first and recipes and things like that. But you never know if crowds are going to want to talk about it. And most of the time they don't. But I had one event in California, a small event. Everybody there wanted to talk cannibalism and they wanted to get into the details. Hey, Paul. I had a story where a delicious fried chicken was a character. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> you 
Okay, I'll be really disturbing and say I would eat the author in the story uh, Notes from the Dog Walker. So I guess I'm saying I would sacrifice myself by becoming the oh. snake eating its tail. How's that? Wow. Wow. Or is that the ultimate narcissism? I bet I'm delicious. I bet I'm just delicious. A, just a just a Paul here, Oribos here. eating your own. Yeah. Try a little bit. <laughs> a, a donut <laughs> of Paul. Uh, Stephen. Uh, that's what I was gonna say, Paul. I was gonna say uh, like, like there's a character in this book, Dragon Day, uh, called Stephen Graham Jones, and I was thinking he would be young and tender, like Alma talks about. But now I can't say that. Um, you know, I realized who I'd want to eat from any book would be one of the characters from Jeremy Robert Johnson's. Um, one of his stories, what's it called? It's where like people have like broccoli appendages and stuff. You know, that would be like not that bad, yeah. I think. But for my own books, um, yeah. um, um, there's a character in my novel, Zombie Bake Off, a wrestler named Jonah the Whale, and he would provide good eating for a while. I would like to eat Jonah the Whale. <laughs> if I was quicker on the, I should have said the, St the very minor character, Stephen Graham Jones in A Head Full of Ghosts, who was oh. a nerdy, who was a nerdy math tutor. Uh, okay, he'd be second on my list. How's that? Look, I've got an abacus, Paul. So two questions to sort of wrap up, but everyone in the comments are asking a lot of pandemic questions. Because um, I guess, I think there is one. They seem to be a pretty popular topic right now. Um, so I was going to ask you guys, because everyone always thinks they're living through the end of everything, right? Like World War One, it's the end of the world, you know, all this stuff. Things continue. Like it's never that sad. There's never a clean break. So clearly, there's going to be. This will end at some point. And so, what's on the other side? What do you think? A, a better, worse, bigger beards, long hairs back in for men. <laughs> Man buns become acceptable. <laughs> well, I'll be the, the the straight man, and then these two guys can be really witty and 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 swoop in. But you know, so I've worked a lot of disasters. And um, some, I mean, this is bad. This is bad. I mean, it's scary stuff. We don't really know all the parameters of the disease. I've worked, you know, situations where it's a lot more cut and dry, you know, where neighbors are killing neighbors and, you know, it's machetes or gunfire that's going to get you. Don't get in the bus, that kind of stuff. But there's always, it always breaks, right? There's all, you, you don't think a country can reestablish itself, for instance, after a civil war. But, but it always does happen. So I do think, you know, the end will be coming and it may not be perfect. We're going through some really rough times now. A lot of people losing their livelihoods, small businesses being forced to, you know, probably, you know, people having to give up lifelong dreams and things like that. So it's not going to be easy and, and it, you know, not going to be painless, but, but you know, we, it, we will see an end at, at the uh, light at the end of the tunnel, I think. Steven? Um, yeah, there's always a rebirth after a death. So yeah, hopefully we were that new flower pushing up through the tundra, you know, after some fashion. But you know what? I, what I keep thinking of is how how our story is going to change, whether on 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 the bookshelf or at the box office. And I don't know. Of course, um, I kind of have suspect that, or I hope, I guess, that we dial back a little bit to um, like Hitchcock's Rope, that movie Rope. It's all just in one room, you know, because we're all in one room basically right now, and that's the imprinting on our minds and. I wonder if when we sit down to write stories, we're not gonna write closed door mysteries. And I love closed door mysteries because um, once they stop being whodunits they, and people start getting decapitated all the time, it starts, it becomes a who's doing it. And that's a slasher, you know? And so hopefully we birth into a slasher place. That's my dream. <laughs> Paul? Oh man, I, I have no idea. And I wouldn't pretend yeah. that I, I do have any idea. I mean, it is a little weird. Like my, my novel Survivor Song is, you know, the virus is different, but like the local response that I wrote about wasn't, which is really kind of strange. And, um, you know, my, my nurse is a sister in a big city hospital in Boston. So I live with daily, you know, worries about her. You know, she was a big help with my book. You know, so I just, you know, hope and dream of, you know, better days for all of us, um, you know, as soon as possible. As, as terms of, in terms of story, um, you know, it's weird. It's like, you know, we say good, better, indifferent. I mean, sometimes, you know, change is just that. You can't necessarily say it's, you know, for better or for worse. It just is, and you have to live with it. Um, so for stories, though, I, I think, obviously, I don't know, like, um, I was going to bring up Scott Poole, uh, wrote a book called Wastelands, The Origins of Modern Horror. 
and his argument within that it's a great book i highly recommend it his you know he he looked at obviously world war and world war one and world war ii but also the 1918 you know flu uh, epidemic and argued about how that really gave birth to the modern horror genre that people you know these global you know horrific events that you know millions of millions upon millions of people died and people didn't shirk away from horror this it's sort of born the genre so what's happening right now you know it's a totally different cultural even globally cultural you know experience you know in terms of horror i mean horror is already here it's already a genre that you know so many people enjoy in so many different you know types of stories so i really have no idea where it's going to go i would assume at least for the next <laughs> few years if not decade that you're going to see a lot of stories that won't necessarily i mean you'll see pandemic stories but you know, a lot of the stuff that we're going to be writing about is going to be about what we're going through right now, but obliquely, like, you know, going around the back door. Like, I I had this novel that I was going to start that has been in my head since, like, December, you know, I, but I didn't get around to start writing it until just now. And, I, and it's a totally different story, and I'm going to avoid, like, 2020 uh, in the story itself, but I know I can already see it creeping in. Um, in different ways. So, no, it's a long answer to say I have no idea. No, no, no. I think it's, <laughs> and I'd forgotten, you know, that book is amazing. The Wasteland book, Scott's book. It's really, really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just, I, it's funny as a, as a writer who writes books mostly, you know, there's always this sense of like, man, it'd be so much cooler if I was in a band. Like, I'm just not musical, but it'd be so much cooler. <laughs> or like, you know, I would love some of that sweet, like screenwriting money. That seems like a good gig. Like, TV writing, you sit in a room and there's snacks. Like, I'm like, I'm so glad right now that like the thing I do, I do alone in a room and I'm very used to that. And it can actually kind of get produced kind of hands off in a lot of ways or by people remotely. Cause you know, I think this is gonna go on for a while. And I think books are gonna be one of those things that like actually new ones come out on a relatively regular basis. Like I feel very lucky. Um, okay. To close this off for the evening, um, two things from you guys. One is um, something, whether it's a, a painting or a, a movie or a book that really just traumatized you, um, that, you know, it's just like, ah. Um, and then one that you find a lot of comfort from, especially right now, that's sort of a recommendation to people where they are right now. I'll, I'll kick it off just based on what we're talking about. To me, one of the most horrific things in the world are suicide animals, which are restaurants that have signs where the animal they serve is eating itself, like a barbecue restaurant. Growing up, we had this barbecue restaurant, Picky Park, and there was this sort of fat pig on the sign, like lifting its shirt up, like bite me here. Um, and someone sent me a picture from a place in LA where it's a pig serving a plate of pork ribs to another pig. Like, I find that so twisted and disturbing. Um, and then in terms of recommendations that are not twisted and disturbing, I just reread Shirley Jackson's um, Raising Demons. And Shirley Jackson, her two domestic books, which are Raising Demons and Life Among the Savages, are some of the funniest most amazing books. I think they're some of the best things she wrote. Um, and I, they don't get enough credit because they're kind of like housewife books. It's about her raising her family. And they're so great. They're so absolutely incredible. So I really recommend them to folks. And I think most libraries have them available digitally. So Alma, do you want to go next? Yeah, I'll jump in just because um, I credit uh, Life Among the Savages as the book that gave me my twisted outlook on life, especially suburban life. This is gonna sound strange, but I read that book religiously when I was very young, like oh. seven or eight years old. And, and I think that's what made me see that what happens in most families is not what you think <laughs> is going on. And, and yeah, anyway, if you haven't read those books, you definitely, definitely should. And I actually reread Life Among the Savages like at least once every year. It's yeah. a comfort read to me, just like you said. But in terms of a really, something that I've found really disturbing, it's hard to disturb me. Um, I have to think about that and maybe I can okay. jump back in later. Okay. Paul, you want to try next? Oh, good. Steven, next, because I'm thinking of disturbing. Things. Okay, Steven, <laughs> go for it. Um, I was thinking about a book that gives, I just went over here to my shelf and grabbed a couple of books, um, both from the E's, it looks like. Um, Love Medicine, Louise Erdrich. Let me get the glare off. Yeah. Um, that book always gives me um, 
I mean, it gives me hope for the novel because I think it's a beautiful, perfect, amazing novel. But um, the way that that novel ends, that may be my favorite ending of any novel where everything, it, things come together in a way that you couldn't have anticipated. And that's, to me, the like inevitable surprise we love at the end of stories. And I think Edric did it as good as, as well as it's been done in that book. This book always traumatizes me. Um, Red East and Ellen, oh, Lunar Park. So good. <laughs> so good. And it ends so well. It, it ends so well, too. He has that lyrical, like, he blasts off into some stratosphere of lyricism at the end of that book that just floors me every time. But that book just fundamentally disturbs me. And I keep coming back to it. Um, the same way, I, you know, I used to come back to Jack Ketchum's The Girl Next Door. I read that book 13 times before I was finally done with it. And maybe I'm not done with it. I don't know. But lately, Leonard Park is the one I come back to. All right, Paul? I'm disturbed. I didn't get to talk about my favorite ending, which is the TV show MASH. I'm just kidding. Uh, although I do like that ending. Um, geez, disturb I guess I'll go with, and I think maybe it was just the mood that I was watching the movie in, but Richard Stanley's The Color Out of Space. Um, which Grady and I discussed on a podcast, Geek's Guide to the Galaxy, with um, Teresa DeLucci as well. Um, you know, the movie's good. I wouldn't call it great, but the, there's something that happens in that movie that I just found, like, profoundly disturbing to the point where I couldn't, I had to, I was fast-forwarding, like, 10 seconds whenever these two, <laughs> whenever this thing kept reappearing. Uh, I just couldn't, I just couldn't handle it. Um, it's really, like, the first time as an adult that I've had to do that. And I think part of it was the time at which I watched it, which was fairly close into us first absorbing ourselves into, you know, this new situation before, you know, like any of us have adjusted, which is kind of weird, like how quickly we adjust a little bit to yeah. like, new normal, which I find disturbing. <laughs> um, for a recommendation, for a blanket recommendation, I've been reading or uh, rereading some Peter Stroud books for my own just personal, you know, comfort. Because um, it's funny, like I had a hard time reading some newer stuff and, and Peter, Peter's stuff can be really complex and intricate in the sentence structure. Um, but I, I found enjoyment through that challenge of him asking me to, to join in the book with him kind of thing. So I found like reading actually harder books easier to do right now than reading maybe quote unquote less challenging books right now. Um, and I would also, I would lastly recommend if you're looking for something a little bit lighter than Peter Straub's The Throat. <laughs> um, Patrick DeWitt is one of my favorite writers. He writes sort of dark, eh, lightly dark comedies. You know, The Sister Brothers, um, Major Domo Minor, which I think might be my favorite of his books. And like, uh, and that's not the favorite of a lot of other people's. It's such a quirky, almost like an adult Princess Bride, but way more dark and satirical um, compared to the movie. The book is pretty dark and satirical. So yeah, Patrick DeWitt, I would recommend. What Straub would you recommend that's not ghost story to people? Oh, I think The Throat is his, is his magnum opus. And even though it's like a, th a third book of the Blue Rose cycle, like you can read Coco or Mystery or The Throat, like one without the other. It's not yeah. like you have to have read those three books. Cool. All right. I think we're going to wrap up. Um, Constance is supposed to uh, magically appear. There she is. <laughs> So, okay, we are going to be wrapping up. I just wanted to, one, say thank you so incredibly much to all of our authors. A huge virtual round of applause. Your book and feel and spirit. Um, if you guys, too, I recommend going through, like, all the comments. There's so much love and everyone, and everyone was so happy to have you guys, and Mysterious Galaxy was really happy to have you guys, too. Um, all of their amazing books can be bought online. We are still shipping, and you can get book plates and everything. The link is going to be up at the video. A huge thank you to everyone for watching and a huge thank you to our authors. I am going to end the Facebook Live now.